On December 9, 1957, an incredible event occurred within the UK. Now known as the Silpho Saucer Incident, it has become known within UFO enthusiast circles as the UK's Roswell. It was a story that was first released within the Yorkshire Post. It told of a mystery disc that was found on the Yorkshire Moors. Scarborough businessman Frank Dickinson, along with two friends, were driving through a place known as Reesty Hill, near the village of Silpho, when their car mysteriously stalled as a glowing object appeared in the sky above them, subsequently landing in the Borax Forest. Mr. Dickinson and his friends bravely pursued the downed craft and found a mysterious metallic saucer in a patch of freshly cindered bracken. Amazingly, when the artifact was cut open, apparently a tiny book was found within made of 17 thin copper sheets covered in 2,000 unknown hieroglyphs. Interestingly, similar hieroglyphics were also supposedly found among the wreckage of the UFO that allegedly crashed at Roswell, New Mexico in June 1947. The remains of the Silpho Moore object were subsequently sent to a London laboratory for examination in 1963, including a perplexing fused section of the metal and plastic which was apparently from the outer casing. Gordon Claringbull, a funded academic from the Natural History Museum who specialized in meteorites and explosives, said in a memo to the Science Museum that he was prepared to wager anything that the pieces of metal were made on Earth. However, although the scientific community was predictably skeptical, Air Chief Marshal Lord Dowding, who led the RAF during the Battle of Britain during World War II, examined the Silpho saucer in 1958. He actually believed it was genuine. Describing it as a quote, miniature computer piloted flying saucer, Lord Dowding was openly convinced it was a genuine artifact from space, according to the report in the Yorkshire Post. The results of the analysis found that the artifacts contained an unusually pure set of metals, cast in highly specific ways, fueling the UFO community's interest in the object's fragments. Will more modern specific analysis shed more light on this enigmatic object's origins? We will keep you posted on any future developments. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, take care. An ancient clay tablet, buried away in the bowels of a British museum, has been quietly baffling historians for over 150 years. This cuneiform tablet has been long housed in the British Museum's archives under collection article number K8538, however, now known as a planisphere, it has nonetheless revealed a fascinating translation telling of an incredible story one which described of an ancient comet impact with our own planet. Recovered in the 19th century, unearthed from the ancient library of King Azurbanipal in Nineveh, Iraq, by Sir Henry Laird. After feverish research, specialists found that 50% of the clay tablet intricately referred to the position of the planets and weather conditions. Yet in addition, the other half of the tablet described how a massive object, large enough to be observed as it was still in space, was tracked as the inscriber witnessed it approaching and subsequently impacting with Earth. Museum curators explain, the Sumerian astronomer, it would seem, decided the event was of such great importance, he made tremendous effort to pinpoint its location in the sky making an accurate note of the object's trajectory relative to the stars. Incredibly, from this remarkable skill, they claim they were able to pinpoint the precise comet, and it turns out that the object observed by the Sumerian astronomer was the asteroid that impacted Kerfels, Austria. We find this astute research, the possibly successful complete decipherment of the tablet, not to mention its ability to allow us to listen to a witness story of an event thousands of years ago, is indeed incredibly fascinating. Just what could the Smithsonian be hiding? 
Established in 1846, it's a tightly knit network of museums and research centers exclusively and uniquely funded by the United States government. Nicknamed the Nation's Attic, and for good reason. Made up of 19 museums, 9 research centers, and even a zoo, it's the official resting place for over 154 million historically valuable items. With an annual budget of around 1.2 billion public dollars, two-thirds of which coming from annual federal appropriations, it's safe to say that if the Institute needed to hide something, it would undoubtedly have the financial clout to do so. Through the years, the meddling in which the Institute has been reportedly involved in can be seen as not only overwhelming, but condemning of a hidden agenda. During our extensive research into alternative and controversial historical discoveries, we've often been confronted with such statements as, the Smithsonian people will be highly pleased to get their hands on this. Though, unfortunately, these sorts of condemning phrases have all but disappeared from mainstream media as the years have passed, they still do indeed exist within newspaper archives, stored within the libraries of Earth, and thankfully, there are many of them. As time has passed, reports of this involvement have become more and more elusive. This could be seen as a direct correlation with advancements within modern communications, the birth of the Internet, along with many other forms of learning, subsequently aiding in the distribution of said information, growing awareness of these reports exponentially. As a result, more in-depth and heightened understandings of evolution theory and the protection thereof becomes more developed and entwined with such institutions. Profiteers from these lies become guardians of secrets which could destroy their status, clearly lending to the possibility and motive for a cover-up. Although reports which hit the internet in 2014 claimed a Freedom of Information Act had revealed that the Smithsonian had covered up the remains of thousands of giants was eventually debunked. The flurry of attention it has created surrounding the topic, an allegation which we personally know to be accurate, has aided tremendously in the search for the truth surrounding these accusations. A source we highly recommend is a book by Richard J. Dewhurst, titled The Ancient Giants Who Ruled America, The Missing Skeletons, and The Great Smithsonian Cover-Up. It can not only be seen as a go-to resource for evidence of a race of ancient giants, but it also details the thousands of giant skeletons that have been found, particularly within the Mississippi Valley, as well as within the ruins of the giant cities over the past few centuries. It catalogues 400 years of excavations, newspaper articles, first-person accounts, state historical records, and illustrated field report, including more than 100 rare corroborative photographs. It reveals that not only was North America once ruled by an advanced race of giants, but also that the Smithsonian has been actively suppressing this physical evidence for nearly 150 years. Dewhurst shows how this suppression began shortly after the Civil War and transformed into an outright cover-up, this being due to Major John Wesley Powell, who was appointed Smithsonian Director, a strict pro-evolutionist. And finally, the 1920s discovery on Catalina Island, a megalithic burial complex with 6,000 years of continuous burials involving over 4,000 giant skeletons, including a succession of kings and queens, some more than nine feet tall. The evidence for which he claims, and with good reason, is hidden in the restricted access evidence rooms at the Smithsonian. The Crystal Skulls, a set of the world's most alluring artifacts, possessing the power to create religions, snaring many a Hollywood figure with their mysticism and rumored possible alien origins. Firstly, how does one tell a real crystal skull from a fake? There are always artists capable of making and selling things that seem old, says anthropologist Jane McLaren Walsh of the Smithsonian Museum. And she should know, Walsh has seen her share of fakes. In fact, she's probably seen more crystal skulls than anyone else alive, subsequently becoming the leading academic on the subject. A stern skeptic with a ruthless ethic, only the most puzzling will convince Jane. Another major player in the skull game, according to Walsh, was Frederick Arthur Mitchell Hedges, an English stockbroker turned adventurer, who in 1943 began displaying a skull at dinner parties which he called the Skull of Doom. 
His daughter Anna later claimed that he had found the skull in a ruined temple in Belize during the early 1920s. However, this was later found to have been a lie. Investigations by the Linnean Society of London, a research institute specializing in taxonomy and natural history, revealed that Mitchell Hedges actually purchased his skull at auction at Sotheby's in London in 1943. How it came to be at the auction house, however, was never established. Which is unfortunate, because the Mitchell Hedges skull, according to Walsh's scrupulous examination, is the only one she has ever had to reluctantly confirm as an authentic crystal skull. What's more, it is the only academically accepted original known within the public archives. Smaller than other examples, which under microscope analysis were seen to have been made using rotary drills, the Mitchell Hedges skull is a more finely crafted, yet more crudely designed example that under the atomic microscope has shown signs of having indeed been an ancient pre-Columbian artifact, which sure enough was constructed using, quote, unknown technology. There are, of course, many examples of crystal skulls around the world, and many more stories surrounding their mysterious construction. Elongated examples, stories of groups of these skulls initiating some form of energy field. Ancient laser-cutting technology has also been claimed time and time again. However, we felt we would approach them from another angle, to experience the rare occasion when modern, specifically funded academic institutes buckle to overwhelming evidence proofs given by the defeated skeptic to those who pursue nothing but the perplexing truth and a direction for study. Made from a single piece of quartz crystal, Mitchell's Skull of Doom is unquestionably an exquisite example of an unknown history here upon our planet. Regardless of beliefs or indeed the superstitions which now surround them, there are a rare few which support the theory of lost civilization and ancient visitation. This skull is much smaller than many and crudely carved, leading museum scholars here to believe that in a world of fakes, this one is the real thing. Researcher Isaac Kwa has published some startling yet not widely known details regarding some unusual space debris that was found in northern Saskatchewan in 1968. It is the largest UFO fragment ever found and was later definitively concluded to have come from space. However, at the time the Canadian military and government could not definitively explain what it was from and somehow managed to escape the clutches of secrecy. Also the Canadian government has been in a mode of disclosure for some time anyway, making UFO documents available for decades at the archives in Ottawa. Only recently they scanned several thousand documents and put them online. The found space debris is one of a number of known, documented crashes of objects in Canada. If you were a government official, how would you react to receiving an official memo with a title beginning, UFO found? What if the memo also referred to a metal fragment, examination of which revealed the exhibit had likely formed part of a vehicle that traveled in outer space and attached relevant photographs? Well, one Canadian official received such a memo in November 1968, along with related memos and photos of the metal fragment. I do not recall seeing any discussion of this memo in any of the UFO books I've read. Dated the 14th of November 1968 from the F Division of CIB, presumably the Criminal Investigation Branch of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, entitled UFO found in Northern Saskatchewan is one part of a set of documents and photos relating to a piece of metal. This astounding official memo states that examination revealed the exhibit had likely formed part of a vehicle that traveled in outer space. The relevant documents indicate that a 99% titanium fragment with a white, ceramic-like crystalline material on one side was found in or around October 1968, but tests indicated it had been down for more than 90 days in the Wollaston Lake area of Saskatchewan, Canada. This other official memo, dated the 24th of October 1968, discloses that the object was titanium, 99% pure, 4 foot long and 2.5 feet wide, and weighed between 10 and 15 pounds. This makes the fragment the largest alien piece from a satellite that has ever landed on Earth. 
That memo indicates that a local newspaper, the Leader Post, was aware of the find. A handwritten annotation indicates the NRC should release information about the find, including the fact that the RCMP lab identified the object. Yet no media coverage ever happened. Man-made satellites are also supposedly made of aluminium not pure titanium. Here are some crashed satellite images, note, none come close to the alien-looking appearance of the Canadian fragment. A report dated the 29th of October 1968 gives the results of a determination of the chemical composition of the object, indicating it was high purity titanium. Higher than previously believed, freelance artist, known as freelance underscore Zemakist, accepted a challenge to create a concept of what part of the craft the fragment may have come from. What do you think it is, was it actually part of a downed UFO? It appears that this is exactly what it was, if you go by publicly disclosed official records. Does this titanium fragment found in Canada, answer the greatest question of our age? 